Okay, so this is the second half of Act 3, Scene 5 of Romeo and Juliet. In the previous scene, we saw Romeo and Juliet spending their final night together and Romeo leaving um, for his exile to Mantua. In this half of the scene, enter Lady Capulet to speak to Juliet about the fact that she will be arranged to marry Paris and to give her the details of her, of her marriage. Her daughter, are you up? Who is it that calls? Is it, my, it is my lady mother. Is she not down so late or up so early? What unaccustomed cause procures her hither? She goes down from the window and enters below. Why, how now, Juliet? Madam, I am not well. Evermore weeping for your cousin's death. What wilt thou wash him from his grave with tears? And if thou couldst, thou couldst not make him live and therefore have done. Some grief shows much of love, but much of grief shows still some want of wit. So she's willing her to stop crying and stop being upset. She says, some grief is appropriate. This is too much. Come on, be happy. Yet let me weep for such a feeling loss. So shall you feel loss, but not the fiend, but not the friend which you weep for. Feeling so the loss, I cannot choose, but ever weep the friend. Well, girl, thou weeps not so much for his death as that the villain lives which slaughtered him. Notice the use of that address term, villain, used by Lady Capulet, that she believes Romeo to be a villain. She then uses the same term again. She says the reason why Juliet is weeping is not because Tybalt is dead, but because the man who murdered him is still alive. And she calls Romeo a villain. Juliet says, what villain, madam? Lady Capulet says, that same villain Romeo. So this address term is the same one that Tybalt used. He called Romeo a villain and Romeo said, villain am I none. So this reminds us that the feud still endures. The feud is still very much ongoing. In villain and he be many miles asunder. God pardon him, I do with all my heart. And yet no man like he doth grieve my heart. When it says aside, by the way, that means that's kind of spoken to the audience almost conspiratorially. Um, spoken quietly to the audience rather than directly to her mother. So she's kind of saying um, that she, she does indeed grieve for Romeo, but she, her mother doesn't understand quite why. Um, this is, that is because the traitor murderer lives. So again, she calls him a traitor, a murderer. I, madam, from the reach of these my hands, would none but I might venge my cousin's death. We will have vengeance for it, fear thou not. Then weep no more, I'll send to one in Mantua, where that same banished runagate doth live. Shall give him such an un unaccustomed dram, that he shall soon keep Tybalt company, and then I hope thou wilt be satisfied. So Lady Capulet is saying to her, don't worry, Juliet, I'm going to send somebody who works for us to Mantua to kill Romeo, to poison him. And then you will be satisfied, and you don't need to cry anymore because the murderer is dead. Juliet, of course, is not happy with this. She says, Indeed, I never shall be satisfied with Romeo till I behold him dead. So she adds that to herself. She kind of drifts off into this dream about Romeo and then says, Until I behold him dead, obviously, mother. So she kind of covers what she's been saying. Is my poor heart for, Sir, for a kinsman vexed? Madam, if you could find out but a man to bear a poison, I would temper it that Romeo should upon receipt thereof, soon sleeping quiet. Oh, how my heart abhors to hear him named and cannot come to him to wreak the love I bore my cousin upon his body that hath slaughtered him. Now, in this whole exchange with her mother, Juliet is being intentionally ambiguous. Ambiguous is just a posh way of saying unclear um, in her responses to her mother. So, She's saying things like, oh, how my heart abhors to hear him name. She wants her mother to think she's furious at the sound of this name of the person who killed her cousin. But really, she's in pain to hear his name because of her lovesickness and her protection of him, of her lover, not wanting anything bad to happen to him. Um, find now the means and I'll find such a man. But now I'll tell thee joyful tidings, girl. So, but, so I'm now going to give you some good news, daughter. And joy comes well in such a needy time. What are they, beseech your ladyship? Well, well, thou hast a careful father, child. Notice how she, as she calls Lord Capulet a careful father, reminding us of that parental role, reminding us that um, Lady Capulet equally agrees with the judgment of her father, agrees with the kind of patriarchal um, control he's exerting over her, believes that she should marry Paris. Well, well, thou hast a careful father, child, one who, to put thee from thy heaviness, hath sorted out a sudden day of joy that thou expects not, nor I look not for. 
Madam, in happy time, what day is that? Marry, my child, early next Thursday morn. The gallant, young and noble gentleman, the county Paris at St. Peter's Church, shall happily make thee, a joy, thee, thee there a joyful bride. Again, we've got that irony that Juliet's mother is saying, Paris will make you a joyful bride. We know actually that's not going to make Juliet joyful. That's going to fill her with sorrow. Um, and actually, again, there's that irony about that idea that the, they keep talking about the great status of Paris and yet there will be huge scandal if the two of them actually do marry because she will be committing bigamy, um, which in the church would be considered to be, um, well, against the law anyway in, in kind of Christian, Christian law. Um, now by St. Peter's church, and Peter too, he shall not make me there a joyful bride. I wonder at this haste that I must wed, ere that he should be my husband comes to woo. I pray you tell my lord and father, madam, I will not marry yet, and when I do, I swear it shall be Romeo, whom you know I hate, rather than Paris. These are news indeed. So she's saying here, she won't be a joyful bride, and why is it that this husband has not come to woo her and to kind of, um, kind of engage with her in the normal practices of courtly love? Why, why are they just arranging this marriage? She, she, she's seemingly offended by that um, when she's talking to her mother, even though, of course, we know the reason why she doesn't want to marry is that she's already married to Romeo. Here comes your father. Tell him so yourself and see how he will take it at your hands. Enter Capulet and the nurse. And this is Lord Capulet's response. When the sun sets, the earth doth drizzle, drizzle dew. But for that sunset of my brother's sun, it rains downright. How now, a conduit girl, what, still in tears, ever more showering in one little body? Thou counterfeits a bark, a sea, a wind, for still thy eyes, which I may call the sea, do ebb and flow with tears. The bark thy body is, sailing in this salt flood, the winds thy sighs, who raging with thy tears, and they with them, without a sudden calm, will overset thy tempest-tossed body. How now, wife, have you delivered to her our decree? This here, when he's talking about um, the, the idea of the sea and the bark, Bark is a very old-fashioned word for a ship, so he's saying her body is almost like a ship that's tossed upon a storm. The, the tempest, the storm, is kind of a metaphor for, for her sorrow and the tempest she feels inside her um, from the death of Tybalt. Um, he keeps talking about her tears running almost as though they were like a sea dashing her body around. So he's basically hyperbolizing um, the sorrow she feels and, and basically saying to her it's not appropriate now that she needs to effectively pull herself together and be happy and so after that speech he says have you delivered to her our decree have you said to her what our plan is for her to marry um paris i sir but she will none she gives you thanks i would the fool were married to her grave this of course is foreshadowing her fate and death have been sealed by this marriage and her mother wishes she was married to her grave. Of course, we know that she is going to die and it's the cause of her marriage to Romeo that her fate and her death has been sealed. Soft, take me with you. Take me with you, wife. How will she non? Does she not give us thanks? Is she not proud? Does she not count her blessed? Unworthy as she is that she wrought so worthy a gentleman to be her bride. So look at the language he uses here. He uses these rhetorical questions. Will she none? Does she not give us thanks? Is she not proud? He attacks her ingratitude, her ungratefulness, effectively, using those rhetorical questions. He calls her unworthy and Paris worthy, implying that she should be grateful for the match they have made for her. And he's astonished by her disobedience. Not proud you have, but thankful that you have. Proud can I never be of what I hate, but thankful even for hate that is meant to love. So she says, I can't be proud, no, because I don't want it. But I can be thankful that you have done this for me with love, even if it's something I don't want. Uh, Capulet says, how, how, how? Chopped logic. A kind of flawed logic, mad logic you're presenting me with here, girl. What is this? Proud and I thank you and I thank you not and yet not proud, mistress minion you. Thank me no thankings, nor proud me no prouds, but fettle you'll find joints against Thursday next. So don't thank me, don't say yes, don't say no, don't say anything else. Just get yourself ready for marriage is what he's saying to her there. To go with Paris to St. Peter's Church or I will drag thee there, thee, on a hurdle thither. 
Out, you green carrion, you green sickness carrion. Out, you baggage, you tallow face. Now, look at these metaphors he uses to describe his daughter. Green sickness carrion. That literally is like decaying flesh. He's calling her decaying flesh. But equally, she's kind of green, almost not only with decay, but with jealousy and kind of anger and, and, and sinister um, features within him within her. He also uses the metaphor baggage as though she's remaining a burden on her fam father. Effectively what he's tried to do here is to marry her off and she's not being given to somebody else. So she remains a burden on him, something he has to carry, something he has to support. Fie, fie, what, are you mad? Good father, I beseech you on my knees, hear me with patience but to speak a word. And she kneels down, so she's, she's kneeling now in front of him, begging him. Hang thee, young baggage, disobedient wretch. Look at that aggravated imperative. Hang thee. I would like to hang you, execute you. Young baggage, you disobedient wretch. Look at all of those address terms. Again, that metaphor of baggage. She's like something he has to carry and look after. And he resents her. I tell thee, I tell thee what. Get thee to church a Thursday or never look me in the face. Speak not, reply not, do not answer me. My fingers itch. Wife, we scarce thought us blessed that God had lent us but this only child. But now I see this one is one too much and that we have a curse in having her out on her howling. So he wishes that she were dead here. And so that metaphor, we have a curse in having her. He effectively wishes her dead at that moment. And of course, they are devastated when she does actually die. Um, and again, remember the patriarchal reading of the text. Capulet has contempt for her disobedience. He expects compliance. The patriarchal reading of the text is that she is punished by fate for disobeying her father in this way. God in heaven, bless her, nurse steps in now. You are to blame, my lord, to rate her so. And why, my lady wisdom, hold your tongue, good prudence, smatter with, smatter with your gossips, go. Notice how the nurse steps in at this moment when he's saying that he almost wishes she were dead. He wishes they'd never had her. The nurse steps in at this kind of maternal figure and says, no, no, that's too much. So remember, the nurse is that figure of parental guidance for Juliet. I speak no treason. Oh, goddy godden. May not one speak? Peace, you mumbling fool. Utter your gravity or a gossip's bowl, for here we need it not. So he silences the nurse. But remember, she works for the Capulet. She has to be subservient to Lord Capulet. You are too hot. God's bread, it makes me mad. Day, night, work, play, alone in company. Still my care hath been to give her matched, to have her matched. And having now provided a gentleman of noble parentage, of fair demnesies, youthful and nobly, li nobly lined, stuffed, as they say, with honourable parts, proportioned as one's thought would wish a man, and then to have a wretched puling fool, a whining mammoth in her fortunes tender, to answer, I'll not wed, I cannot love, I am too young, pray you pardon me, but you will not wed, I pardon you, graze where you will, you'll not share this house with me, look to it, think on it, I do not you suggest, Thursday is near, lay a hand on heart, advise and you be mine, I'll give you to my friend, and you be not, hang, beg, starve, die in the streets, for by my soul I'll ne'er acknowledge thee, nor what is mine shall ever shall never do thee good. Trust to it, bethink you, I'll not be forsworn. So here he he relates her, he kind of compares her to what he calls a whining mammoth. A mammoth is a doll or a puppet, but actually historically a mammoth was like a false god, an effigy, um, almost like a scarecrow, a lifeless figure. So by calling her that, he's suggesting that she's no longer this thing that he loves and worships and idolises. She's almost become a kind of corrupted, false version of herself now that she's become disobedient. He also says to her, um, you will not house with me. If you are mine, I'll give you to my friend. But if not, hang, beg, starve, die in the streets. So he sees her as like an object, like a possession that is his to give away. And he says, if he will not be my object to give away, he disowns her to a beggar's death and wills that she will become destitute, which in Elizabethan society, just as um, most later periods in history, a single woman who had lost her kind of honour um, and had been 
been cast out to live alone and become effectively a spinster would become destitute and would be forced to live a life on the street. She'd have no livelihood, she'd have nobody to support her. Women had no ways of, of earning money independently, certainly no um, kind of respectable ways of earning money. So he condemns her to that life. So he almost places her in a way that she's got no choice. At this time, women would have had no power at all. So she uses he uses these aggravated imperatives, one word imperatives, hang, beg, starve, die in the streets. They're really aggressive in tone as well, aren't they? Okay. She then says, Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? Oh, sweet, my mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week, or if you do not, make the bridal bed in that dim monument where Tybalt lies. So here she's talking about her fate. Is there nothing hanging in the clouds for me? Nothing good in my fate, that personification of the clouds. Is there nothing still good coming for me from heaven and from my destiny? Um, and she wills her mother to be um, patient and kind, but she says, if you won't, you'll need to make my bridal bed in the tomb where Tybalt live, lies. So she's effectively saying she would rather die. And of course, there's a tragic irony to this in that her parents condemn her to death. And of course, she does actually die. Um, and so this raises ideas again about the absence of parental love and guidance from her parents. They don't seem to love her or support her, but see her only as a kind of object for the advancement of their family, for the for the for the good of their family through marriage. Oh God, nurse, how shall this be prevented? Oh sorry, hang on. Talk not to me, for I'll not speak a word. Do as thou wilt, for I am done with thee. So even though her mother is less aggressive in the way that she speaks to her, she equally disowns her. Juliet says, Oh God, oh nurse, how shall this be prevented? My husband is on earth, my faith in heaven. How shall that faith return again to earth unless that husband send it me from heaven? By leaving earth, comfort me, counsel me. Alack, alack, that heaven should practice st stratagems upon so soft a subject as myself. So again, she's talking about her fate and how awful it is that fate has conspired against her. What sayest thou? Hast thou not a word of joy, some comfort, nurse? And the, the nurse actually becomes quite pragmatic and sensible here. And she sees the danger, the precarious situation that Juliet is in. So she gives her the advice about what she thinks she should do. Faith, here it is. Romeo is banished and all the world to nothing. Or that he dares ne'er come back to challenge you. Or if he do, it needs must be by stealth. Then since the case so stands as now it doth, I think it best you married with the county. Oh, he's a lovely gentleman. So she's saying, I actually think it's best you do marry Paris. Romeo is a dish clout to him. An eagle, madam, hath not so green, so quick, so fair an eye as Paris hath. But shrew with my, my very heart, I think you are very, you are happy in this second match. For it excels your first, or if it did not, your first is dead, or twere as good he were as living here and you no use of him. So she degenerates Romeo in comparison to Paris and she suggests that Paris is in fact a better match for her. And she says, look, Romeo is as good as dead if he is um, banished, so you may as well marry somebody else. Speaks thou from thy heart and from my soul too, else beshrew them both. Amen. What? Well, thou hast comforted me marvellous much. Go in and tell my lady I am gone, having displeased my father to Florence's cell to make confession and to be absolved. So she says that she's she wants them to tell her parents that she's gone to confession, she's she's willing to do what they want her to do, and she's gone to the friar to confess her sins. Um, so she wants um, the nurse now to say that she will marry Paris. Marry I will, and this is wisely done. She looks after the nurse because the nurse has now just exited. So this is again a little soliloquy to herself and to the audience. Ancient damnation, O oh, most wicked fiend! Is it more sin to wish me thus forsworn or to dispraise my lord with that same tongue which she hath praised him with above compare so many thousand times? Go, counsellor, thou and my bosom henceforth shall be twain, out of the friar to know his remedy. If all else fail, myself have power to die. So she's going to the friar, not to confess, but to hope that he has a plan. She says that if this has to continue, her bosom, her heart will be ripped in half, and half of it will be with Romeo, and half of it will be with Paris. But she wishes that if the friar has not got any kind of remedy, then she must die. Now this line... 
ancient damnation oh most wicked fiend is biblical imagery it reminds us of that idea of original sin once again that idea of verona as the garden of eden if you remember from the previous lesson so in this when she says ancient damnation she's talking about that original sin and the sin that she therefore carries within herself and she's attributing her own punishment to that of eve after eve was attracted to and tempted by the serpent in the garden of eden so she's talking about the sins she has committed and not only is she going to the friar in the hope that he will absolve those sins but also in the hope that he will have a plan for her okay so that's the end of act three